Welcome to the second presentation on balances as guides towards a sustainable future. The topic in this short video will be balances. How do we set up balances? How do they work? And how do we evaluate them? And then I will apply them to a simple example that is relevant to the topic of interest. Well, let me start directly with the way how we usually write a balance. It's stated here. The change inside a balance volume equals what is entering plus what is produced minus what disappears. This looks very theoretical at first sight. Some life into it. How can we understand what it means? Well, let's look at an example, a simple example that everybody knows more or less, and that's a purse. So what we want to do is we want to set up a balance for a purse and try to understand what the different contributions that we have here, these five things, what they mean. Now, what we apparently need at the first step is something to say about the balance volume. We have to define the volume we want to look at and define the boundary between this system we are looking at and the environment, the rest of the world, so to speak. And we do that by defining the balance volume by well, specifying a balance boundary, which is given here at, as this red dotted line. Okay, so what we want to do, we want to look at this system, we call that system, or balance volume, whichever way you prefer it. And what we look at is the change inside this balance volume. So we have something in here and we want to see how that changes. And this can change now due to different effects. But first of all, things can come in and things can leave the balance boundary. Yeah, so money can come in, increasing the amount of uh, money within the purse, or it can leave because you, for example, pay something and um, or pay for something and that means that the amount of money inside the purse will be decreased. So we see that what the change inside is always what is entering, which means it's added to, so to speak, to what has been there before. And if it is leaving, it has to be subtracted what, from what has been in there before. So the change inside is either what is entering minus what is leaving. Now, what are the two next contributions? Well, in a purse, it's a little bit difficult and nevertheless, I guess I found something to show what it really means. Right? Of course, you won't have that in your purse usually, but think as if it were such. You want to have a, here such a nice animal that produces gold coins, for example. Which means that what is inside the purse will increase just because that is so. Which means something is produced inside this balance volume. Now, producing money within the purse is a little bit tricky, admittedly, but if you look at processes, of course, reactions can occur, things can happen that lead to something being produced. Chemical engineers always have that there are always chemical reactions taking place, for example, so new components are produced. So we have to take that into account in general uh, to be able to describe the balances properly. Then something can disappear. It's shown here. I hope it doesn't happen too often to you. You can burn the money, or the money can burn. Well, actually, banks today are able to recover, so to speak, or to find out how much money it has been. So even if it is lost, you will get that refunded, if you are lucky, at least. And um, if they can do something with the ash and find out how much it was. But this is just to give you an idea of how such a disappearance of something can be produced in such a, or for such a balance. So if we describe how much is produced, how much disappears, and the entering and leaving streams, or quantities, then we are able to evaluate the balance. And we know at every single moment how the content within the balance volume has changed. We see the change inside the balance volume coming from these four contributions. And this balance, and this is important to me, it is exact. No way around it. 100% exact. The only thing that can happen is that you made an error in evaluating the different contributions. It can, for example, be that actually 
there's another quantity entering and this of course means that your balance how you evaluate it is wrong but the balance in general the idea of the balance that is exact and ideally exact well actually for some uh, properties the balances have to be fulfilled really exactly because otherwise the world would behave completely differently and this refers especially to energy and mass despite or the only exception there is this famous Einstein equation E equals mc squared yeah, so there is some interrelation between energy and mass but mass or energy are kept constant and they are constant if you even if you take or especially if you take this E equals himself mc squared into account. If that would not be so, the world would be different. Okay, so we know we have a balance. We know how it know how it works. And now the question is can we derive the method how to use a balance? Well the idea is of course, I just say say it in this slide, we set up the balance volume so we know we first define what you want to look at, the system you want to look at. And then we describe these, uh, these five contributions. And generally, one of those is unknown. Yeah. For your bank account, for example, if this were a bank account, the change inside is perhaps not known, but you know what is entering. It's a booking positive or a booking negative. So you have these, and then with that you are able to see how much a change inside is at is happening. Actually bookkeeping of your bank account is solving these top three contributions because you don't have these last, last two usually. Okay. Well actually you sometimes have them. If it disappears it means you have something to the bank for, for, the, for the accounting so to speak. This you can regard as something that disappears if you like. Well anyway. Uh, you don't to want to go into these much details with this. It's a um, picture of what's going on anyway. Uh, so don't take it this picture too serious as referring to the balance. So if you want to evaluate the balance, what we do is we first define the balance volume and we take care that this boundary completely encloses our system. In all three dimensions it has to be fully surrounded so that we can directly decide is something, something passing through this boundary or not. Is it inside, outside or is it passing, in which direction is it passing. So we first have to set that up and define that. The next thing is that we quantify the contributions entering or leaving across the balance boundaries. And for each of these contributions there can be more than one. There can be two quantities entering, three leaving or whatever. Then we quantify what is produced and what disappears inside the balance volume. We describe that quantitatively. And we also quantify the change within the balance volume. In general, we try to define the five contributions that we have seen before. And, well, if you set up the balances, usually at least one thing is not known, one property is not known, one of the variables is not known. And then we can use the balance in order to back out this missing quantity. We solve, so to speak, the balance for this variable of interest. This is the variable which is unknown. We will see how one applies that in the following. The example we want to look at is the radiation of the sun and how that behaves or interacts with the earth. So this is the picture that we have. Sun is obviously beaming at the Earth with quite a significant intensity. Earth is relatively cool compared to the Sun, but nevertheless it also radiates into the universe. And the question is, can we say something about this interplay of incoming and leaving radiation for the Earth? So you, in the end you want to set up the balance for the Earth and see what does that tell us. In order to do, so, do that we step on step by step and we start with the Sun. We have the sun. Here it is. And now we want to set up a balance like this. And we want to set the balance volume such that it directly encloses the sun, directly and only the sun, Not, nothing more, just that. Directly at the surface of the sun. The radius of the sun is 700,000 700, kilometers. 
quite big, roughly doubled as far as double the diameter as the moon is has a distance to the Earth. So uh, this is quite a significant uh, radius. And now we want to solve the balance. But actually, I tell you, we don't really want to solve it. We want to use the balance, and that's what you actually you usually do. You play around with the balance and try to solve it in, in a way and set it up in a way that you find something out of about unknown variables. So we'll set it up more or less, but then only account for certain contributions, and I, I'll explain you why and how we do that. Do that. Now, apparently, solar radiation is leaving this balance volume, and that's the main contribution we want to look at. So the question is, how much radiation is leaving this balance volume? We can describe that. We have physical laws for that. We assume that the solar, uh, that the sun is radiating as a so-called black body. Well, actually, the sun doesn't look black, but that's not meant by this uh, definition. It means only that it's an ideal radiation, which corresponds more or less to the temperature, to the movement of the molecules, and then they radiate as a black body, so to speak. So let's assume that for a moment, and actually it's not such a bad assumption. Then we can describe the power of the radiation with the so-called Stefan-Boltzmann equation. And the Stefan-Boltzmann equation says the power of radiation equals the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, I just give in a moment, times the surface which is radiating, times the temperature of the radi radiating body to the fourth power. The sigma, as I said, is a Stefan-Boltzmann constant. It's given here in um, units, with the appropriate units. It's just some natural number, some natural constant, so to speak, um, that, has, that takes this value. Now, in the next step, we want to express the area, the surface area of the sun. That's the area that is radiating. And the surface of area of the sun is, of course, 4 over 3 pi times the radius of the, radi of the sphere, so to speak, to the second power squared. So this is the surface of a sphere with a radius of r. In this case, it should be the radius to the sphere. The sphere should be the, radi uh, the, the sun. So we have to use the radius of the sun for this. We know the sigma, we know the pi, we know the r of the sun. We have give, given it in the slide before. We only have to say something about the temperature of the sun. And this can be measured uh, and is given as this number, 5,778 Kelvin. Now, what is Kelvin? Kelvin is a unit of temperature, and it's actually almost the same as degrees Celsius, only there is a shift of 273.155 Kelvin between the two. That is, the um, degree centigrade, uh, centigrade scale has its zero at 273.15 Kelvin. So there's just a shift. The distance one degree Kelvin, uh, one Kelvin, now I'm, I'm saying it wrong, Actually, one Kelvin corresponds, the difference in one Kelvin corresponds to the difference of one degree centigrade. So di this difference-wise, they are identical. They scale identically, only the scales are shifted by these 273.15 uh, five Kelvin. We can now take this number, plug it in here, plug in the radius of the sun, plug in this constant, and then we find that the solar radiation has a power of 1.28 times 10 to the 26 watts. Well, 10 to the 26, this is a 1 with 26 zeros behind that. I can't imagine how much that is. So hopefully, if we continue with thinking about these things, we will wind up in the end with numbers that are more easy to grasp. Now I've explained everything. This is the power of the sun, of the radiation stemming directly from the sun. Now, actually, we want to set up the balance for the Earth, not for the Sun. There are only the Sun is one contribution in the end. That's why we are looking at it. So the next step, we want to look at the Earth. And we realize that the Earth has a distance of 150 million kilometers from the Sun. So Earth is cycling the Sun on the average of, uh, with a distance of 150 million kilometers, quite a big distance. 
Otherwise, if it would be less, it would be pretty hot. We will see why. Okay, so this is that. Um, and now we want to set up balances again. And actually, want, what we want to do is to, we want to set a balance for this balance boundary. And what we want to do then is to compare actually the balance for this boundary with the balance for this boundary. Yeah. We want to compare those two. If we do so, we have these balances. The change within is the entering, the leave minus leaving plus produce minus disappearing. We do that for the red balance and we do that for the blue balance. Comparing these two, we realize that if we look at solar radiation as a property we want to balance, we see that, well, if you look at the whole system, in between these two balance boundaries, there is more or less nothing concerning uh, that radiates and little that absorbs the radiation. So the balance should be more or less the same, meaning that the power of radiation leaving this boundary will also be the same leaving this boundary. So crossing here is the same amount of radiation as is crossing here. Of course there's a change within, but the change within concerning mass or whatever is mainly taking place within the sun and within the sun is also enclosed in this red balance. So that's the same for the red and for the blue system. There's hardly any radiation entering, so these two are more or less zero. And of course then produced and disappearing of radiation can be something. Of course within the sun gigantic processes are taking place, also their radiation is produced and disappearing, it's caught by the molecules or the, by the elementary particles moving around within the sun. So there are contributions, but that's all taking place within the sun. And within the sun is also now in the red balance volume as well as in the blue balance volume. So these two are identical for these two uh, balances. So if you write down these two balances, we see that actually these two are identical, this is identical, this is essentially zero, meaning that these two have to be identical. Because if these are identical, this is zero, and these are identical, these two have to be identical as well. Meaning that the solar radiation leaving the red balance volume has to be the same as that leaving the blue balance volume. The red one we have calculated already. We know how much radiation is leaving the red balance volume. And now we can look at this balance volume, which is of course more relevant for us because it has a distance from the Sun which con corresponds to that of the Earth. Now looking at the Earth as a, as a whole in one step is a little bit, more com com little bit too complicated. I would like to look at it step by step again. So look, let's look not at the Earth, but just at one square meter. We know the uh, solar radiation through, through the red, red um, balance volume is the same as through the, red, uh, through the blue balance boundary. And here we want to place one square meter. And now we want to set up an equation describing about the power per square meter, so to speak, of some of a square meter at the distance from the Sun of 150 million kilometers. How do we do that? We know how much the Sun is producing, of, uh, how much solar radiation the Sun is producing. This is the number we have just calculated before. And then we know that the area receiving this radiation is at a distance from the Sun of 150 million kilometers. And of course the area is again 4 over 3 times pi times the r squared, and the r is now this 150 million kilometer, kilometer. This is the surface, so to speak, of the blue balance we have seen before. And then the power of radiation per square meter is p over a, it is 1367 watts per square meter. Just evaluating these, uh, this equation, this p over a, plugging in these two values, this value in this equation, plugging in the radius here, and then you wind up with this number. So 1367 watts square per square meter would be the radiation if you place 
the square meter of something perpendicular to the radiation at a distance of the Earth relative to the Sun. And this is called this, uh, so, uh, the solar constant. It's a quite big number actually. Yeah, it's of the order of 20, a little bit more than 20 light bulbs of 60 watts placed on a square meter, which is not that much. So quite a huge amount of energy per square meter. So huge amounts of energy coming in from the sun towards the Earth. Now this is only for one square meter. How about the entire Earth? Now let's in the first step look at the Earth, not at a square meter, but as a circle of the radius of the Earth. That's actually the area that is seen by the Sun. If you would be the Sun, you would see a, a circle of this radius, the Earth's radius, um, at this distance that we have evaluated already. And of course now we have to multiply uh, the radiation per square meter with the area of this circle with this radius in order to get the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth as a whole. So if we do that, we take this solar constant and we determine the area that is receiving this radiation, what the Sun sees, so to speak, of the Earth. It's a circle. It's pi times r squared. You know that from school. Of course, this is the radius of the Earth squared. So on the entire Earth, we have a radiation power from the Sun coming in 1.75 to the 10 to 17 watts, which is again a gigantic number. But in the end, you will wind up with simil simple numbers, I promise. So this is the Earth, the, the power of the Sun, of solar radiation, on the entire Earth. Now we know, since quite a while, that the Earth is not a flat disk, but it's a sphere. And we have to take that into account. It's not a disk, it's a sphere. The radius is identical, but the surface is different. The surface of this sphere actually is not that of a disk. And the Earth is always rotating. Yeah, so one at the moment is this uh, surface being hit by the solar radiation, then it's the other opposite, and it's always changing. So we have to distribute the incoming solar radiation over the entire surface of Earth to get the average value of radiation on the Earth's surface. So we have to divide this number we just got before, the entire solar radiation hitting the Earth, and divide it by this entire surface of the Earth. If you remember the equation just some slides ago, this 4 has been added because the volume of a, or the, the area of a sphere is 4 times that of the disk. So it's 4 pi time, 4 pi times r squared, r squared of the Earth. So what you wind up is 342 watts per square meter, and this corresponds to 3,000 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. And this is now a number that you can compare to something. Yeah, if you, for example, look here at your electricity bill, you find some statement on there on kilowatt hours per year that we have used. This usually are some thousand kilowatt hours per year that we use in developed countries. And these are supplied on very few square meters on the average Earth, so to speak. Of course, this is the average, averaged over everything. And this is not taking into account that actually the sunlight is not hitting us as we are living on the ground, so to speak, of the Earth, because above us, well, there are clouds. There's dust in the air. All that means that the sunlight is not really hitting us at the ground of, uh, at, the, at the floor of the Earth, so to speak. So this is an average value, and it does not account for all these effects. If we take that into account and measure really what is coming, uh, um, what, what is received by the Earth's surface, we wind up with this diagram. And here are shown, shown now values between 800 and 2,800 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. Actually, they omitted the year over there. Um, 
So this is the annual radi radiation, and because they say annual, they can write it like that. And we see that at those, at some spots on Earth, but only on some spots on Earth, we reach almost these two, uh, these three thousand kilowatt hours per square meter and here. Somewhere in North Africa, South Africa, Australia a little bit, and then some regions in America are also showing this high intensity of incoming solar radiation at the ground. In other regions you have uh, clouds, for example, in the, in the polar regions where the incoming uh, solar radiation is not really perpendicular to the, to the ground, so they are also the values are significantly below these 3000 kilowatt hours per square meter. We see somewhere in Europe we have uh, regions well the range in the range between 1000 and 2000 kilowatt hours per square meter well, in this central part of Europe more or less same holds for United States for example and also we find similar values in the um, southern american uh, region so this shows the distribution of the sunlight hitting the ground of the earth is not very equally distributed. This average value above the cloud, so to speak, does not wind up at the ground of the Earth. Okay, but this is still not what we wanted to do. We wanted to say something about the balance, the energy balance of the Earth. So we don't want to look at this system, we have understood this now, but what we actually want to do, we want to focus a little bit more on the Earth set up the balance for the Earth, because that's what we in intended to do. We know how much solar radiation is hitting the Earth, we have calculated that now, we have that number. But actually, as I said already in the introduction, Earth itself is this balance volume that we define now, so this is now the balance we want to set up, Earth itself is radiating. Of course it radi it's radiating at a much lower temperature as the Sun, but nevertheless, since the temperature is non-zero, not zero kelvins, it is radiating. And how high is this radiation? So we have to set up the balance now for the incoming equals the leaving radiation. And actually we have calculated how much is coming in and we have now to set up the balance including what is leaving, this blue balance volume. So let's set up the, the balance. The change within the radiation, power so to speak, within, is the entering minus the leaving plus produced minus disappearing. Just writing the balance without saying anything about how big the different contributions are. And now we want to evaluate that. Well, the power change within, we want to set this to zero because we want to regard steady state. Steady state is one prominent state also in chemical engineering. It means that with time nothing changes. We want to assume that we have steady state. Today the same as in say 10 years, say in 100 years. So within we want to assume that the energy within the system is constant. It equals the entering from this coming in from the Sun minus the leaving which is the radiation of the Earth itself plus what is produced minus what is disappearing with respect to energy. Well actually we have some nuclear reactions inside the Earth, but compared to these two contributions, this is negligible. Also, what is disappearing, actually, I don't know of any process there. There may be some, they are small as compared to what the Sun is doing to the Earth. So we assume that these two are negligible, and we want to get steady state, equilibrated, in an equilibrated state, so to speak, the change within then is exactly zero and under this assumption. Okay, so zero equals these two uh, powers. The power coming in from the Sun due to radiation and the power leaving the Earth, which is now here written down more explicitly. It's again the same as we have seen already for the Sun, but now of course with earthly values. It's the stefan boltzmann constant, which is universal times 4 pi, times the radius of the Earth squared, this is the overall surface of the Earth, times the temperature of the Earth to the fourth power. We know this, 
we know that, we know pi, we know the radius of the Earth, so the un only unknown variable is the temperature of the Earth. So we have set up the balance, one variable is unknown and we now solve for this unknown variable. Here again the power from the Sun for the entire Earth is given. If we solve this now, solve this now we wind up at the fourth root of the power from the Sun divided by 4 pi sigma times r Earth squared. If we evaluate that we wind up at 278 kelvins or with a shift in temperature scale 6 degrees centigrade. Well actually this value looks not so bad. If you try to measure the Earth which is not, not such a primitive endeavor anyway, it's rather complicated actually, you wind usually up at slightly higher values and you might think well this is an inaccuracy of the measurement. Usually you find plus 15 degrees on the average. That's what the climatologists tell us. And you might say, well, plus 6 and plus 15, that's not such a difference. Taking these big numbers into account, that can easily be an error of estimating these numbers. Yes, but now I'm coming in. I'm engineer. And I tell you, well, look at the system, sit back and look at the system and the balances. Did you forget something? Yes, and unfortunately we forgot something. We realized just some slides ago that there are clouds. And clouds are actually reflecting the sunlight directly so that it does not hit the ground. We saw that. The radiation at the ground was significantly reduced due to clouds, the dust and whatever. So actually the Earth doesn't have the chance to emit that power again because it does not receive is it is not received at the ground. So we have to take into account that actually some of the radiation is directly reflected into the view back into the universe. The question is can we estimate how much that is? And now comes in the engineer, it says well take some value that is reasonable and play around with that. Try to estimate that from independent sources, that is how much cloudiness do we have how much is the reflection there and if you do that you find that 0.3 is a reasonable number. That is the degree of reflection is roughly 30%. 30% of the incoming energy is reflected back and does not take part in the balance that you want to set up directly at the Earth. If we take that into account we use the same equation just plug in here this 1 minus eta eta being this degree of refraction, that means that only 70% of the power coming from the Sun is really entering our balance volume and contributes to the temperature of the Earth. If you do that, you wind up with 255 Kelvin, which is now minus 18 Kelvin, or minus 18 degrees centigrade. And this is cold. This is more than 30 degrees colder than we think. We think we have roughly plus 50 uh, plus 15 degrees centigrade. The question is how does that come about? And here comes into play the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect, how does that work? Oh, there's a misspelling, just forget about that. You know what it, how it spells properly. And there's a natural as well as an anthropogenic greenhouse effect. Natural because there's water vapor around. Yeah, the humidity of the, of the air is not zero, it has some humidity usually. And also we know that there is some CO2 around naturally, and we know that there's some methane around naturally, there's some dust around, all that contributes to the greenhouse effect. How to explain the greenhouse effect? Well, let's first look at the Earth balance without the greenhouse effect some radiation coming in from the Sun, some being reflected, 30% of what is coming in. So only 70% are then passed through through the Earth. This is the Sun directly coming from the Sun and the Sun beaming at us at a relatively high temperature. And high temperature, temperature means that the radiation is short-waved. Then the radiation hits the Earth's surface, only the fraction really entering not that which is reflected. And then of course power, radiative power is uh, emitted from the Earth, from the Earth's surface. Since the Earth's surface is colder, 
means it means that the uh, radiation that is leaving the Earth's surface is more long-waved. It's heat more or less, where this is in the region of visible light. Visible light has a shorter wavelength as heat, as compared to heat. So this has a longer, longer wavelength. Unfortunately, the atmosphere is relatively uh, transparent for the short wave radiation, but it's relatively compared to that less trans, um, transparent for the long wave radiation. Meaning that, again, some part of this radiation is held back, is reflected or somehow absorbed in the atmosphere. Now let's first forget about this. Let's think that we don't have that. And then the balance we set up before says what is coming in equals what is going out. So the temperature of, of the Earth is shifted to such an extent that the given amount coming in equals that is going out. The going out there occur this temperature to the fourth. Yeah, so we shift, we, we, we uh, increase the temperature, so to speak, until the outgoing power of radiation is identical to the incoming power. Now what happens is that a certain amount of the energy that wants to leave the Earth actually is held back within this greenhouse shield, so to speak. Like the glass of a greenhouse, that's the idea behind that. So this is held back. And this means, of course, this leaving energy or power is less if we keep the temperature constant, this what is entering is uh, exiting is less than it's coming in, which means if you want to get equilibrium again, same coming in, same going out. We now have compared this stream and that stream of energy, this power, and we have to increase the temperature of the Earth a little bit further. So that what's coming in, it's a given number, equals again that what is leaving, taking into account that something of that is held back. Meaning the temperature of the Earth is increasing. So the temperature of the Earth always occurs as a result of a balance, of an energy balance of the Earth. What's coming in has to equal what's going out if you want to have a constant situation at the Earth's surface, meaning steady state. Here we see how these greenhouse gases affect this balance. It means that the temperature of the Earth needs to increase in order to balance the incoming and outcoming, uh, outgoing energy flows. And we see that it's positive, of course, for us, because we then wind up with a plus 5, 15 degrees centigrade and not at the minus 18 degrees centigrade, just because of the natural greenhouse gas uh, gases, uh, greenhouse effect due to water vapor and CO2 mainly. So what we saw is that the temperature of Earth always results from an energy balance. It's the solution to the energy balance, the Earth being in steady state. You want to get a constant level and not every hundred years going up and down, just a constant level. I also showed that the balances are exact and they are fundamentally valid. Only you can apply them with errors in there. We saw that, that they are prone to errors actually, that you forget something about clouds directly reflecting sunlight into the universe, not entering our balance volume at the ground of the Earth. So there are many chances to evaluate balances in a wrong way. So one has to be careful to really to get the complete picture. And this is expressed in the last statement here. All influences need to be considered. You have to sit down and look at if every single contribution coming in, coming out, occurring and disappearing. And only if you then have the complete picture, you can try to evaluate them quantitatively and try to figure out which are the big contributions and which are the smaller contributions. And are the smaller contributions so small that you can neglect them? And hopefully, in the end, then, you wind up with one single unknown variable. Actually, that's what you usually do. You write down all contributions, entering, leaving, occurring, and disappearing, or produced and disappearing. Then you look at their relative magnitude and the variables incorporated in the different descriptions of the different terms, different contributions. 
And then you throw away throughout one contribution after the other, starting with those, those of the smallest effect and then continually, kin continually increasing effects until you wind up with an equation with only one single variable left. And then you solve it for that, then you perform a sensitivity analysis, analysis. you look well, if I assume some, something for the next biggest step or contribution not accounted for, how much could that influence my result? And then you get an, a feeling, this intuitive fin feeling of the engineer, how well behaved the system actually is. So with this I have shown you a little bit uh, how to set up the balance, how to solve the balance and how to play around with balances. And beside that we have learned something about the greenhouse effect. Which we need of course in the end if we want to look at atmosphere, CO2 and climate. So we, we have learned how to use that for describing the balances for the Earth and a little bit about this greenhouse gas effect. With that we have dwelled a little bit on chapter 2, so to speak, balances. How to set them up, how to use them and learned a little bit about those things here, atmosphere, carbon dioxide and climate. But only a very little bit. We will dwell on that in much more detail in chapter 4.2. The next chapter then would be where we are today, describing the basic information that we need in order to assess our current state of affairs concerning fossil resources, for example, how we are using them, sustainable resources, how we are using those. That's what we send, want to set up the next time. With that, thank you very much and I would happy if you would join me again in the next presentation or next little small video on balances as guides towards a sustainable future. Thank you very much.